Hello everyone, my name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. This series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. For today's webinar, we're very pleased to be hosting Brian Hayden. Brian is an assistant professor in biology at the University of New Brunswick, where he leads the Stable Isotopes in Nature Laboratory. Brian received a PhD from University College Dublin in his native Ireland and worked at Queen's University in Belfast and the University of Helsinki before settling in New Brunswick in 2014. His research is focused on aquatic ecology and encompasses multiple aspects ranging from invertebrate, invertebrate food webs in streams to migration and feeding patterns of baleen whales. Today he will discuss part of this work trying to uncover the patterns of marine feeding in adult Atlantic salmon and how this may relate to increases in marine mortality. After this afternoon's presentation, we'll be opening up the floor for a question and answer session. And you'll have the option of asking your questions directly using your microphone, or you could type them in and we'll read them aloud to Brian. I will now turn the webinar over to Brian. Perfect, thanks, Darla. Hello everyone. Uh, leave the camera on for a minute so I can just say hello and you can see me in the in the, the glory of my basement here where we where we get to do these things from now on. Um, so as Darla said, so I'm going to talk a bit about some of the research that's sort of going on in my in my group in UNB at the moment, um, focusing on Atlantic salmon, really trying to get a better handle on what what salmon are doing at sea. And while my name is sort of here, I also have a lot of other people that I just wanted to highlight right at the start. And these are people who are either doing, so I'm gonna present work that for the mass, vast majority of us, other people have actually done. Um, and they're either students working with me or technicians or other people like Martha and Brian Denson who've sent us a lot of the, the samples that I'm going to be able to talk to you about. And one quick note, uh, there we go. So I do a bit of Twittering at Dr. Hado, and yesterday I sort of popped this up and there's been quite a bit of interest. So if anybody is here from the, directly from Twitter, hello. And I hope this is as, I hope, I hope that I didn't oversell this. Let's put it that way, yeah? So as Darla mentioned, I run a, a research group in, in UMB and my group were sort of part of the, the Canadians, Canadian Rivers Institute. And we've got a pretty broad mandate of sort of research interests, but everything kind of falls into this overall area of trying to understand the ecological response of aquatic species, communities and ecosystems to changes in their environment. And that's that that that's broad because because my interests are pretty broad, and because of the, the ubiquity, say, and that the power of the tool, the stable isotope ecology, what I'm going to talk to you a bit about, I've had the the benefit of being able to do work really right across the right across the, the world, looking at how aquatic ecosystems function. And here in Atlantic Canada, we've got a lot of work going on in rivers, some stuff at sea lamprey some big river systems this is up in the athabasca in western canada uh, quite a bit of stuff going on a collabor with atlantic salmon and that's really a collaboration with people in both the uk and we can extend that line a little bit down and and move us into ireland as well with some colleagues in in galway who are sort of doing comparable work to what i'm talking going to talk about today on the atlantic salmon in addition to this, with the SINLAB, we're working on mudflat systems in Trinidad, marine upwelling zones in, in South America and Chile, invasive species systems in the Mediterranean, and some tropical stream systems as well, and the complete other end of the spectrum, looking at frozen lakes in, in northern Finland. So a big breadth, a big diversity of, of work that's going on, but we're really using kind of the similar, similar approaches and similar tools to ask similar questions about as these ecosystems change, how is that affecting fish species primarily within them that, we're, that we have a, an interest in? And there are, there are few fish species out there that people have a, a greater interest in than Atlantic salmon. And this is kind of just a, an example of some 
different pieces of, of artwork or examples of interactions with, with the fish throughout the, the native range of Atlantic salmon, throughout sort of the, the North Atlantic region. And where, where I come from, this is an old tenpenny piece we used to have in Ireland, right the way over to uh, New Brunswick down here where I live at the moment. Anywhere, anywhere salmon swim, people have a, an intrinsic interest in them and have been using them as a, as a food source and, and multiple other things for, for hundreds and thousands of years. But as we know, and I probably don't need to reiterate this to anybody on, on this call, that Atlantic salmon are in trouble. And these are some data from, well, again, sort of match to region here, looking at the number of Atlantic salmon returning to, to rivers here in New Brunswick. We see very similar trends. This is in Scotland and even combined across multiple different systems within the North, Atlant North Atlantic region. We're seeing since the sort of 1970s and probably even earlier, a, a pretty dramatic decrease in the number of Atlantic salmon, adult Atlantic salmon, returning to their, to their natal rivers to, to spawn. And this obviously has been a, a major area for, for research in the last number of decades, trying to understand what's happening to these salmon and why aren't why they're why they seem to be disappearing. And one of the complexities in answering this question revolves around the, the life cycle of the salmon, because they have, again, as everybody on this call likely knows, separate or discrete freshwater and marine phases within their life cycle. So in order to understand what's happening to the salmon, we need to be able to understand what's happening in both of these phases. Now we're fortunate that there's a lot of really, really excellent research out there around what's happening in the, the freshwater phase. The challenge, one of the challenges we have at the moment is trying to understand, get a better understanding or at least a similar level of understanding about what's happening here in the in the marine phase. Because more and more research, and this is a really nice paper from uh, Gerald Chapuis a few years ago, is highlighting the fact that a lot of this marine, a lot of the mortality we're seeing in salmon, or that the decrease in population sizes, is related to an increase in marine mortality. And even the fact that the, the trends of diminishing returns or diminishing numbers of returning salmon are almost ubiquitous across multiple different populations kind of lends or brings us to think this because we're not seeing, it's not restricted to one or two rivers, which would indicate that there's something going on in the freshwater side. It's happening throughout the range, which probably indicates that it's what's happening in the marine phase that's really critically linked to these decreasing in decreases in fish that are, are returning to rivers. And this has been sort of, as I alluded to, an area of really growing research at the moment. And, and a nice sort of study, a nice report that came out from a, the ASC group in Scotland a couple of years ago, identifying or trying to identify the like what they've termed as the likely suspects of Atlantic salmon decline, or the and they put it together as this idea of a a likely suspects framework. And there, if we follow the the life history of the species, we can see different particular threats that it's exposed to and its ability to complete its life history. And this kind of starts with what's happening here in the, the freshwater ecosystem that for salmon to to go to sea they need to be able to put on, they need to have enough food to, to grow, to become smolts, and to go to sea at a good healthy size and good healthy condition. So they have a, a better chance of survival at sea. Once they start moving to sea, they start running a gauntlet of various different predators, be they striped bass here, we'll talk a little bit about seals and things like that later or in, in a moment that are maybe sort of more so associated with what's happening in Europe. Humans obviously are probably their, their, their biggest predator uh, or one of their main threats. It's easy for us to, to focus on things like striped bass, but we're probably doing just as much damage 
uh, to, to wild salmon populations as anything else. Then while they're at sea, they need to, similar to the freshwater system, they need to have an availability of the right type of food that allows them to quickly put on mass, put on body mass, improve their condition, get big and fat and healthy, so they can have produce lots and lots of eggs as the, as the females return. As they return, there's often interactions with, um, with aquaculture. We see a lot of this has been highlighted as a, a potential impact both in, in Eastern Canada, but also there's quite a few studies from, from parts of Europe and Ireland where, where I'm from about either fish escaping from pens or direct interaction with, with pens and possibly picking up additional parasites, things like that. Then these adult salmon, as they're waiting for the right conditions to, to come back to hit their actual home rivers, are again exposed to various different predators and there's various different risks of, of, of predation. And all of these, these likely suspects need to be seen in the context of, of climate change, which is basically saying that the conditions to which Atlantic salmon have adapted and have evolved and are, have been living over the last thousand, few thousand years are really no longer present in the areas that we expect to see Atlantic salmon. So the point, one of the points I'm trying to get across here is that there are, even if we narrow this down and say, we're really interested in what's happening in the marine phase, there's many, many different threats and many, many different things that are either each are impacting salmon. We don't know whether one is having a, the main impact. We don't know whether it's an interaction of these different threats or stressors that are having the major effect on, on the, the lower returning numbers of, of Atlantic salmon. But to me, this is one of the areas that, so it's one of the best tools and best approaches we have at the moment to try and figuring out what's happening to these salmon at sea. And my research or the part of my research program that's sort of looking at Atlantic salmon kind of fits into this likely suspects framework. And I see two kind of areas that we're really focused on. And that's in terms of the, the prey for Atlantic salmon while they're at sea, what are they feeding on and how has that changed over the last 50, 60, 70 years as we're seeing the, the numbers decrease? Is, it, is there a quick case where their preferred prey are less available or so they're restricted in diet or they're switching and feeding on something else? And also the question of, of climate change and how that's changing the overall food web structure that the salmon are reliant on while they're feeding in, in marine environments. And these are really two areas that I'm going to, to kind of focus in on today and to talk about most, most of what I talk about today will focus on these. And it's kind of driven by two main questions that, two, two of the things that if I'm, if I'm lying in bed thinking about salmon, these are the, the questions that, that tend to keep me up at night. Unlike a lot of people on this call, I didn't grow up, although I did a lot of fishing, I didn't really grow up salmon fishing. So my questions usually aren't around what type of fly do I need to use? It's usually more research-based if I'm thinking about salmon. And that's really, what are they doing while they're at sea? And how has that changed over the last 50 years? And can we link that to these decreasing, declining returns? And I'm going to, talk about how we're addressing some of these questions through two separate studies and one of them is focused primarily on inner bay of fundy atlantic salmon populations and then the other is kind of focused more on on what's happening in in greenland and looking at some long-term changes in the in the diet of atlantic salmon in greenland and i'm going to I'll, I'll be making this point a number of times as we go through the talk, but what I'm presenting here really is work that graduate students and uh, really excellent graduate students working in my group have sort of taken on some of these questions and taken on some of these ideas and are applying themselves to, 
to really try and get at some of the answers and find some of these linkages. So we can see the main thing I'm interested, or one of the main things I'm interested here is, is diet. And to answer that, we need to be able to estimate what diet is or what, what these fish are feeding on. And the typical way of doing this is to go out into a river or the lake or, or, or the sea, catch a load of fish, cut open their stomachs and have a look at what's inside and try and identify that down to whatever taxonomic level we can. There's a number of reasons we're not overly keen on this approach, particularly with something like a, an Atlantic salmon, where the populations are already depleted. We don't want to then say, okay, well, I now need to kill another 50, 60, 70 fish per population per year to understand what they're feeding on. An alternative that some other colleagues can use is, whoops, is to, that might be playing, let's see. Uh, we might, we should see a turtle appear down here in a moment. Um, is to put cameras on their consumers and track these cameras as they move around. No, nope, I don't know. There we go, okay. And with that, this way we can actually identify what the food consumer has been feeding on, either having cameras at birds' nests and things like that, or in this case where they're actually fixing cameras to leatherback turtles and releasing the turtle, and then the camera will give a record of, of what it's feeding on. I'd love to do this with an Atlantic salmon sometime, but unfortunately, we're not quite there yet. And also, this is a really nice approach. Either of these can work in, in real time or, or moving forward, but it's very difficult to, to go back in time and figure out what salmon were feeding on 50 or 60 years ago if we don't already have these, these data available. So we need a, a slightly different approach. And this is where stable isotopes come in. And this is where I thought I not mentioned at the start that I use isotopes for all sorts of different research questions. And it's probably because it's such a, it's a tool that lends itself to these type of issues very nicely. It's not perfect. Hopefully we'll have some chances to talk during questions at the end about ways that it's, it's certainly imperfect and limited. But to get some information that you couldn't get otherwise, it's a really, really interesting approach. And it's based off the idea that as sort of really so seeking, so, 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 easy for you to say, eh? really clearly and simply put by, by Carl Sagan, that the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars, were made of star stuff. And this is a, a very dramatic and exuberant way of basically saying what a lot of us know from our, our high school chemistry or high school biology, that humans and every, every, that everything basically is made up of atoms of, of different types of elements. And if you take the, the average human body, and this is, this is wet mass before you take out any of the water or anything like that, we're around about 65% oxygen, 20% carbon, 10% hydrogen, reasonable amount of nitrogen, and a head full of everything else. Our human body, is constantly growing new cells and constantly shedding dead cells. And our tissues are constantly turning over, which means that we constantly need to be getting new elements of these atoms, or new atoms of these elements rather, to, to build this new material. And we get these from the environment around us. Some things like hydrogen and oxygen, we get from the, the water we drink, and also from the food we eat. Other elements like carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, only come from the food we eat. So our, our body is made up of atoms that have come from the food that we've eaten. And essentially what we're doing in, in isotope ecology is we're trying to identify the type of food that those different atoms came from. And we can do that because all atoms of specific elements are not the same. 
there's tiny, tiny differences, very, very slight differences at the atomic level. And here's a, a typical, a sort of an illustration of a typical atom of carbon. We have six protons and six neutrons in the nucleus and electrons spinning around outside. There's variants of this, and almost every element will have these different variants. And the different variants are what's called isotopes. And they, so here's an example of two separate ones of, of carbon. This is carbon 14. And that, the only difference here is that it has six protons in the nucleus, but eight neutrons. So it has a higher atomic mass. The, the weight of this is slightly higher. And because it has eight neutrons, it's quite unstable and it breaks down over time. And that's why we can use the, the ratio of carbon-14 to, to other isotopes of carbon to estimate how old something is, how long it is since that was formed. Carbon-13, on the other hand, is stable. Here we've got six protons and seven neutrons in the nucleus, and that's stable even over geologic time. So if something has synthesized, a primary producer has got some carbon from the atmosphere, incorporated it into the, the tissue that it's produced, that will stay throughout a, a long time period, or that isotope of carbon will not break down. Because of the very slight difference in atomic mass, the isotopes work slightly differently as we go through any biological reaction. So for example, C3 and C4 plants, which are basically plants which have a, have a, a different photo, type of photosynthesis, a different photosynthetic pathway, a different way of producing um, leaf material and plant material from CO2 that they've extracted from the atmosphere. And because of that, they have slightly different carbon isotope ratios. C3 plants, or C4 plants rather, because they've got a more efficient pathway, their carbon isotope ratio is more similar to what we see in the atmosphere. They're using their carbon more efficiently. So I'll talk about, when I talk about carbon isotopes, you might see me using this notation here in some of the slides, this sort of delta 13C and these values of per mil. I'm not going to get into the, the nitty gritty of, of why we do that, but essentially when you see this, what I'm talking about is the carbon isotope ratio. And it's the, the ratio of carbon of heavy to light carbon isotopes, 13 to 12, carbon, carbon 13 to carbon 12, relative to an internationally agreed standard. And in my in in the in the sin lab we have some really essentially really really high precision balances that we can go and measure any type of tissue and we can identify the ratio of heavy of carbon 13 to carbon 12 in that tissue in marine systems we see slight difference. The majority of the, the photosynthetic pathway here, in, certainly in the phytoplankton, is the same. But there's differences in the carbon isotope ratio, the ratio of heavy to light carbon isotopes in marine phytoplankton in different parts of the ocean, because the plankton in different parts of the ocean are growing at different speeds. And that means that they either, if they're growing very fast, they need to use, they're using up a lot of carbon dioxide. If they're growing slowly, they're using up less carbon dioxide. So we get slightly different, we can get some variation as well in the carbon isotope ratio of, of primary producers in the oceans. And I'll get back in a few moments as to why this is important. What's really useful or what's really critical for, for me as an isotope ecologist who wants to use these isotopes to understand ecology is the old idiom, the old adage, you are what you eat. And essentially this means that as we grow new tissue, we need 
carbon for those for that tissue we get that carbon from the food that we eat the food that we eat has a ratio of heavy to light isotopes of carbon and as we consume that food the tissues that we synthesize the tissues we grow from that food are using that carbon and will have a very similar carbon isotope ratio this is a nice data set looking actually at uh, big mac patties so these researchers got big mac patties from right around the globe and saw a difference in the carbon isotope ratio of the big macs from europe here where they were predominantly around about minus 25 indicating that they the cattle had been raised on c3 plants had been raised on wheat as we move to to north america and south america we see that the majority of uh, big mac patties have carbon isotope ratios typical of c4 plants so the consumer matches the carbon isotope ratio of its food of its prey and this isn't just true for cows this is true for us as well this is another data set looking at human hair of europeans and north americans and looking at typical trends in the carbon isotope ratio and what we see is that the carbon isotope ratio of europeans is depleted it's lower than north americans and this is because the north american diet is far more reliant on c4 crops it's a corn based diet the food human food chain is based on corn whereas in europe it's more so based on wheat or other c3 plants so right the way through a food chain with carbon we have a really nice tool to identify what source of primary production a consumer was feeding on the other isotope i'm i'm going to to talk a bit about is is nitrogen and nitrogen's quite different because there's typically quite a standard offset a quite a standard difference in the ratio of the heavy to light isotopes of nitrogen with each trophic level so if we move up through a food chain the top consumer on that food chain will have a will be enriched in the heavy isotope of nitrogen relative to other consumers it'll be indicative of what it's been feeding on plus around about three parts per thousand so this is really useful for us because if we have both of these together carbon and nitrogen combined we can look at any consumer and we can estimate where it's been get what where what primary producer was fueling it and what trophic position it was feeding at and we can do that just by having a piece of the tissue we don't need to have caught the fish and have looked at its stomach and identified what it's eaten we don't need to have any other information about that other than just a piece of tissue that we can analyze and this is really so this is an example of a of a way we're sort of putting this to use within my research group and this is a graduate student who's working with me this is alex dickey and alex is doing a really interesting project she's building a an isotope food web and a dietary food web for the bay of fundy and she was doing this in collaboration with dfo and she's been out with dfo a couple of times on their trawlers catching whatever fish and invertebrates we can catch taking them back to the lab analyzing them and trying to figure out where they sit within this bay of fundy food web and this is some a small subset of alex's data and we can see some invertebrates here in blue the blue triangles and some fish here in red circles and the first thing i'm going to sort of draw your attention to is that we've got very clearly two separate components of this food chain particularly in the invertebrates we've got things like sea scallops squids filter feeding periphera herring alewife that are mostly pelagic and these are fueled by phytoplankton we then have benthic consumers we've got various different crabs we've got benthic feeding fishes like flounder and sea ravens and these have very different carbon and nitrogen isotope ratios so we can use this to build a food web model 
of the Bay of Fundy and understand how different species are, are related to each other and what different species are feeding on. And this kind of, a, maybe you're saying eventually, hopefully you're not saying eventually, I haven't lost everybody already, but this, after, after a little, quite a bit of background, this kind of brings us through to really what, we're, what I'm here to talk about and the first of our, our research questions. And this is really based on the inner Bay of Fundy Atlantic salmon and where, what's essentially what's fueling them. So many people on the call will probably know that the inner Bay of Fundy is a really, really interesting area to, to study Atlantic salmon because we've got several unique populations that are, that are really critically, critically endangered or critically threatened. And these are populations typically that spawn in some of these rivers around the, that flow into the inner Bay of Fundy. I should say for people who don't know, the inner Bay of Fundy, the Gulf of Maine is kind of just down here. We're sort of right at the top of, um, top of the US on the, on the East Coast and into to New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland is up here. So we've got salmon that spawn in these rivers go down into the bay. This Bay of Fundy is an extremely productive region. And it's thought that certainly historically, these salmon, a lot of these salmon never left the bay, that they stayed and fed throughout the bay, probably for one, maybe two years, and then returned to their natal rivers to spawn. That unlike some of the fish leaving, say the St. John River or the Miramichi River, that would have, or some of these rivers from Nova Scotia, that would have traveled all the way to Greenland. These inner bay of Fundy rivers fish stayed within the inner bay. So this leads, to us, uh, leads us to a couple of questions. It's trying to identify one, is this, is this the case? We've got, we know people think this, we've got some tag, tags or tracking data that kind of indicate this is true, but we don't really know for, for certain what proportion, say, of the fish returning to all of these rivers have gone to Greenland or, or have not. And similarly, if these fish are staying in the bay, we don't know what they're feeding on. And where we've got these critically threatened populations, these are some sort of essential questions that we need to be able to answer. And this is one of the reasons I kind of introduced Alex's work as a way of showing how we can use isotopes to uncover a food web. Because as I've sort of noted, we can, we can identify fish within the Bay of Fundy or isotope ratios that are kind of characteristic of pelagic feeding fishes or benthic feeding fishes. And now all I need to do, or all we need to do, is to get samples from, some, from salmon returning to, to different rivers, analyze them, and add them to Alex's data set here. And then all of a sudden we can understand what these fish have been feeding on while they've been in the bay. So this is, so we now introduce another graduate student. So this is Emily Wiggum. And Emily is doing a, a PhD with myself and Kurt Samways in UMB. And again, this is a project, I'll talk a bit more about some more of Emily's work in a moment, but this is project, that's something I didn't mention. Boom, boom, boom. Yes, <laughs> this Inner Bay of Fundy work is funded by the um, ASCF and also the MB Wildlife Trust Fund. And it's basically money from both of these groups which have allowed us to, to do this work. And they've supported some of Alex's work. And also now they're supporting some work that Emily is doing, looking at fish, looking at Atlantic salmon that are using the Inner Bay and also I'd like some that are not using the inner bay and trying to make some comparisons between them. And we've kind of teamed up with um, the, the Fundy Salmon Recovery Project to do this work. And with them, we're, they have been sampling Atlantic salmon that are returning to several rivers in and around the inner bay of Fundy. And I'm gonna talk about three rivers. Whoa, give it away, give it away. Oh no. I'm mainly going to talk about three rivers, the Big Salmon River here, the Upper Salmon River, 
and the Gasparo River. So these are three rivers which drain into the inner bay of Fundy. And what Emily has been doing is taking scales from these fish, cutting out the outer band of marine growth from, from those scales, running that and looking at the isotope ratios from that outer growth section and relating them to what Alex has shown. And I'm going to show you some of the preliminary data that Emily has generated around this question. And the first of these now is looking at salmon in the Big Salmon River. And here are the data from Alex's work where we know generally what pelagic species look like and what benthic spe fish species within the bay look like. And if we look at the, the salmon returning to the Big Salmon River, they typically seem to pool more closely to the, the benthic feeding fish within the Bay of Fundy. So it looks like, as we might expect, they're predominantly staying in the inner Bay of Fundy, but they're mainly feeding on benthic prey, which is probably not what we'd expect. So there's probably something we need, some bit further we need to look at this to try and really resolve is there a, a niche or something else within the bay that we haven't quite got our head, heads around yet? Next up, we're looking at the inner bay of Fundy. And again here, or the upper Salmon River, sorry. And again here, we've got fish that are so closely associated with the benthic component of the inner bay of Fundy food web. I'm going, there's a reason I don't trust those data and I'll, I'll, refer, I'll re return to that in a moment. Finally, I want to talk about the Gasparo River. And these are really interesting because these seem to be a little bit different. If anything, they're kind of similar to the benthic food web, but quite a few of them are not similar to the benthic food web. They're similar to, to something else. And this indicates that they're possibly feeding outside of the bay. And to sort of better understand this, we need to sort of take a step back and get more of a an overview on isotopes in, in marine ecosystems and what we know about salmon in these marine ecosystems. And I introduced some of this earlier when we talked about the um, spatial variability in carbon isotope ratios, that in different parts of the ocean, primary producers will have different carbon isotope ratios. Similarly, in terms of nitrogen isotope ratios in different parts of the ocean, typically primary producers will have different nitrogen isotope ratios related to the abundant availability of nitrogen and a whole host of different factors like that. The same rules apply. A consumer, is, their isotope ratio should reflect their prey. So if there's variation here in the food web, that should be reflected in, where, in the salmon if these are feeding in different areas. And we've been doing a bit of work on this in the lab at the moment. This is another student working, this is Rachel Forbes. And Rachel is working with these extremely large salmon-like things over here. She's working with, uh, with right whales. And what we're doing, what Rachel has been doing, is working with samples of, of right whale baleen. And this is sort of their, their baleen, their feeding structure within the mouth. And that grows, this is a, a plate of baleen from one of the whales that Rachel's working on. And that grows co constant, continuously. That full length probably represents around about five to six years of that whale's life. So if we go along the, the edge of the baleen, we can essentially go back in time through with, with that fish and identify with that fish, with that whale, excuse me, identify where it's been or estimate where it's been because we know these whales are foraging along this very extreme nitrogen gradient and let's hope this works i'm going to jump forward one further that didn't work let's do that okay it's not going to work it doesn't matter what we can see is if we go through time we can see these peaks and troughs these are two different whales and their nitrogen isotope ratios as it changes along the gum so we're looking through time and we're tracing this migration of this whale up and down along this nitrogen gradient. We want to try and do the same thing with salmon. Unfortunately, salmon, we don't have baleen that's over a meter long and is integrating values across uh, that we can pick up specific weeks. But what we do have is scales. And as these scales are grown 
they will integrate the isotope ratio of what the fish has been feeding on as that piece of scale was grown. So here's some inner growth on the scale while it's in fresh water. And this is typically what we'd expect isotope ratios for that part portion of growth to be. Alternatively, if we look at the outer growth while this salmon was feeding at sea, we'll see very different isotope ratios. And there's some work has even been done looking at salmon returning to multiple different rivers to try and identify, or even rivers, rivers at different times, to try and identify what, what they've been feeding on, or where they've been feeding. And I'm just gonna bring your attention to some of this. And we're looking at some time series data here and looking at changes in the carbon isotope ratios of multiple different salmon across salmon, taken from scales at different years. And one of the things we can see is that there's actually differences between rivers. Here we see the Restigouche River as values here around about minus 16.4, minus 16.5. We look up here, Western Arm Brook River values closer to minus 15.5. Differences between different rivers indicates that they're probably, these fish are probably feeding in different regions. And some work has been done by, and this is a work from work in the UK, trying to estimate based on what we know about the spatial variability of carbon isotope ratios in phytoplankton, where these different fish have been, have been feeding. And I'm just briefly going to highlight this because I'm taking far longer going through any of this than I thought I would. But essentially, what, what Mackenzie and et al. were able to do was looking at the isotope ratios, were able to identify roughly where they thought different fish were, had been feeding, what part of the ocean they had been feeding on in, in, in different years. So we're going to try, we want to try and apply that to the Bay of Fundy and try and apply that to, to understanding what we see in the, these fish that are returning to the Gasparo River. And here we've got data from multiple different colleagues. And again, I'm sort of highlighting some different, these ellipses are generally what we'd expect to see based off multiple different samples we've run of pelagic fish in the Bay of Fundy, Atlantic salmon, which have returned to the United Kingdom in Britain, Atlantic salmon, which have returned to rivers in Ireland. And we know that these fish in the, in the UK and in Ireland were most likely feeding in, in Greenland. They certainly were not feeding in the inner Bay of Fundy. And then we've got some fish that we absolutely know were feeding in the inner Bay of Fundy because they were samples that were taken from aquaculture facilities within the inner Bay of Fundy. And these are the, the red points here are salmon that returned to the upper bay or sorry, the Upper Salmon River in the inner Bay of Fundy. And this is one of the reasons I said we were suspect of these data, because they align very closely with aquaculture facilities, where those fish had lived probably six to 12 months before they were captured. So it seems quite likely that the values that we're picking up here are incorporate what these salmon were feeding on previously before they were released to the bay. When we look at the, the Gasparo fish, we see that they pool exactly where we would expect salmon that have been to West Greenland to, to pool, and quite different to where we, would, where we saw the um, salmon returning to the Big Salmon River pooling. So this is some evidence that salmon that are returned that are within the inner bay of Fundy, not all rivers, are staying within the bay. We've got some evidence to suggest that they are, but the data are still quite uncertain because there's very, very few fish returning to these rivers. So we're really restricted by, by sample size. Well, one thing Emily is doing to try and overcome this is looking at a, a time series, taking scales from scale archives of rivers in the inner bay and different areas around the inner bay, and looking back probably from the 1970s or to present day to see we can bump up our sample size that way and then identify with our long-term date longer term data series whether those fish in the inner bay over through time are always different to fish in the in the outer bay 
Okay, I'm, yeah, if there's any questions about this interbase stuff, we can chat about this later. I do know that's not how you spell Gasparol, but there you go. Um, the next piece I want to talk about, again, is some of Emily's work. And hopefully in a couple of years, when she's a newly minted PhD student, Emily will be able to come and give one of these seminars and give a far better overview of what she's done and what the, the data she's generated have shown than, than I can at the moment. Really at the moment, we're just kind of, we've got some data in and it's enough to certainly get Emily and myself and others working with us quite excited about what, what we can see. The other portion of this for the next sort of five minutes or so before we wrap out that I'm gonna talk about is what we're seeing in another data set of salmon values. And this is salmon that were collected by NOAA, DFO, and various different scientists off the west coast of Greenland from 1960s right up until present day. And through some funding from the Atlantic Salmon Research Joint Venture, and DFO, colleagues in DFO very kindly opening their, their sample archives to us, Emily has been able to start to piece together what we see is, as changes in the isotope ratios of, of Atlantic salmon in Greenland over the last, well, from around about 1970 through to present day. And this is really important data because it allows us to do a couple of things. It allows us, us to, to see how salmon in Greenland have changed. It allows us to compare what we see for salmon in Greenland with what we see for salmon returning. I showed you some data already of, of salmon that have returned, data from salmon that have returned to multiple different rivers, either in, in North America and also in Europe, in the, those UK systems. And we're estimating where those fish probably were. And one of the reasons we're estimating it is because we don't know what the isotope ratios of fish feeding in Greenland are through the, along those time series. So this is a really important part of Emily's work is that it's going to give us actual data for what the fish in Greenland look like, what their isotope ratios were, and that, we can, that way we can test our models to see are we accurately picking up where what there are, are estimates of what those fish, if they were in Greenland, what their isotope ratios should have been. And we can also really try to understand some of those questions from the, um, the likely suspects framework about has the diet of salmon feeding at sea, feeding in Greenland, how has that changed over the last few years? Is it that salmon are feeding on something else? Or is it that there's been an overall change through the, through the Greenland food web? So I'm just going to show some of the, the preliminary data that Emily has got at the moment. And we're fine tuning our um, application for additional data from DFO at the moment. So I'm hopeful that we will, in a year or two, have a much broader data set to, to, to report. But what we're looking at here is we've got around about 10 fish in multiple different years, 68, a couple of years in the 70s, a couple of years in the 80s, late 90s, 2010, and more, most recently in 2017. And we don't see any really strong trend, any really strong pattern of an overall shift in carbon isotope ratios that would indicate that across this time frame, there's been a steady standardized change in the food web in, in Greenland. There is some evidence, there's clearly something interesting happening here in 1984, and there is some evidence that maybe since 2000, there's been a decrease, a depletion in carbon isotope ratios. But we need to get those additional data in to see if that's real, or is it just some noise within the data set? But I want to focus in on this 1984 question for a moment, because it's, it's one of the strongest data points we have, and it's something we're trying to figure out what's driving it. Is it related to, to changes in sea surface temperature or, or productivity? Well, what we can say is that there's, there's an El Nino event here in early 1980s. It could be associated with that. 
But we also have El Nino events here in the late 90s, where, and, and more recently, which didn't show up in our data. We know that we can see that sea surface temperature in, in that part of the North Atlantic was quite was was lower than normal in the around about 1984. But again, it was similarly low in the in the mid to late 90s or the mid 90s. And we don't see those extreme values replicated. So we don't really know what's what's driving that anomalous 1984 value. What it gives us an opportunity to do, though, is to relate what we're seeing in Greenland to salmon that are returning to multiple different rivers. Because we see this anomalous value here in 1984. And if we look at when, what, what values we see in fish that return, that were probably in that night we're feeding in West Greenland in 1984, what do we see when they returned to their natal rivers? Here's data from Soltowit on the St. John River, where we see a depletion in returns of one sea winter, a multi-sea winter fish. They're quite low around that 1984. We've got one sea winter fish here from Sinatambi at all of multiple different rivers. And any river that he's got 1984 data for, we also see that those values are depleted. So this tells us something important. It tells us that there's something happening in Greenland and it's evident in the fish that are returning. So we've got really nice evidence that studying what's happening in Greenland can give us a better understanding of what's happening in the marine ecology of these fish as they, as they return. Again, we can sort of look at this, we can use this to identify where different populations may have been. This is our Greenland 2010, our Greenland 27 data, and we're looking at fish that return to the Bush River in Northern Ireland, the Dee River in Wales, the Gasparo River in the Inner Bay of Fundy, some rivers in Newfoundland. They're all very similar to what we see in Greenland. Interestingly, we've got some systems that aren't. The Upper Salmon River, I discussed earlier why that isn't and why I'm not convinced about that data yet. Muddy Bay Brook here in Labrador has values outside the range of what we see in Greenland. That indicates, to me at least, that those fish were not feeding in Greenland before they returned to the Muddy Bay Brook. So we can identify outliers. We can identify fish that are associated with, um, with feeding in aquaculture facilities. And again, we can do this just having the scales without ever having settings, without ever seeing the fish. Just as I finish to close, I want to talk a bit about what Emily has seen in her nitrogen data. And again, here we've got the same year classes, and we're looking at nitrogen of fish that were sampled in Greenland across these years. There's no, again, like we see in carbon, there's no strong pattern in either direction, but we have this really outlier group here in, in 2017 that's elevated relative to everything else. And one other thing that's interesting, you might remember earlier in this talk, I mentioned that three, around about three per parts, three per mil nitrogen is equivalent to one trophic level. Well, let's look at some of the salmon here that we're seeing. Look at the variation we see in salmon in Greenland, all captured in the same region of Greenland, all the same size salmon, all from, uh, well, they are from different regions, but that's not associated with nitrogen. Um, that they span, they can span two, three per mil. And that indicates that this salmon up here was feeding probably one trophic level higher than that salmon down there. So the salmon feeding in Greenland, their resource, their diet there seems to be quite variable. There's different fish are doing very different things while they're feeding in Greenland. We can look at this again, similarly trying to trace back to where salmon have been. And we can compare the Bush River, the D River, the Gasparo River. We're looking at nitrogen here as opposed to carbon. And their values here are quite similar, we see, to what we see in, in Greenland. Again, Woody Bay Brook has values that are not similar to what we saw in Greenland in 2017. They're more similar to what we see in Greenland in 2010. And 
this is one of the part one aspect of this data that I wasn't expecting to see, and it's really makes us makes me think a lot about what's happening to these salmon as they're moving from Greenland back to back to their natal rivers. Because we look here, this is the values, typical values we see for a salmon in Greenland from 1960s to 2010, say. It's around about eight and a half to ten and a half per mil in nitrogen. Let's compare that, that range to what we see for salmon returning to multiple different rivers. And always, almost always, the salmon as they return are enriched in nitrogen relative to the salmon that we see in Greenland. So there's a couple of things that could be happening here. Either these fish are feeding a lot on high trophic level food as they're returning, as they're coming back to their, their natal rivers, as they're, they're feeding, they continue to feed on the return migration. Or they're assimilating their body tissue, they're assimilating their fat and protein reserves during that return migration. And that would give us the same bump here, because essentially from an isotopic perspective, that would mean that they're, they're feeding on Atlantic salmon as they return, because they're assimilating their own tissue. So we may have some evidence here that we can pick up fasting or changes in the, what these fish have been doing as they're returning and the offset between what they were doing at sea versus what we see when they return might give us some indication of whether there's a, a starvation or a food pressure on the fish as they return. The very last thing I want to note is similar to what we did in the Bay of Fundy, we can put these fish into a, a Greenland food web and try to figure out what the fish have been feeding on while they're in Greenland. And what we see is that depending on 20, in 2000 and 2017, and we have included 2017 here because we had quite different, particularly nitrogen values, is that they're pro predominantly feeding in the pelagic component of the food web. There's certainly no sign of that benthic feeding that we think might be evident in some of the inner bay river, inner bay of fundy systems. Well, they're feeding probably equivalent to things like sand, to things like capelin or other secondary consumers that are feeding on copepods or um, sand eels or possibly even other small fish, small pelagic fishes. There's some sort of wrap out thoughts. Um, predominantly, we think that these salmon are feeding as, as secondary consumers, mainly as pelagic secondary consumers. We can link what's happening in West Greenland to what's salmon returning in their natal rivers, particularly with that 1984 marker. The nitrogen values are different though, and that tells us that there's something really interesting and really ha important happening. And then we want to say, how has this changed over the last 50 years? And at the moment, these data are kind of inconclusive because we need to have a bigger data set. And we're going, we're at the moment doing some compound specific isotope work, which is a, a more advanced technique, which will basically allow us to estimate just from those individual scale samples, what trophic position that the fish have been feeding on. With that, I'm just gonna thank lots and lots of people who have helped out. I'm gonna apologize for talking far longer than I thought I would. And if anybody's left, I'll, uh, I'm more than happy to stay online and chat for a while and see if anybody answer any questions or at least try and answer any questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Brian. That was an excellent presentation. Um, so as Brian said, we'll now open up the question and answer period. So folks have two options. Um, you can either type in your question and I'll read it aloud to Brian, or if you uh, press on the hand icon, we can unmute your microphone so that you can ask your question directly to him. So I see we've already got a few questions that have come in. Um, first question is from Bruno. Calvalho de Mendonca, I, and I apologize for my, 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 my likely mispronunciation of your name. Um, uh, he was wondering about uh, passing along a reference um, from your uh, salmon scales reflect changes through time slides. So I think it was the, the Sinatambi, yes, yeah, um, yeah. Or, or Mackenzie. 
Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, if Bruno, if you send me an email, um, I can I can send those on. Or what I could even do, Darla, I can send you links to those. And maybe because I know this talk is going to go up on YouTube, so we could put it in the um, the description of, uh, of the YouTube. Yeah. Of the YouTube. Yep, I'd be, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Robert Gaddis Jr., um, who asks, given the complexity of the isotopic results, might there be a need to do some gut analyses, perhaps using, using regurgitation? Yes, <laughs> to, to answer, to give a simple answer. So isotopes work really, really well to give you a general picture, to say, is this generally are these two rivers generally similar are they generally different is this fish generally feeding at a higher trophic level than that fish to to know is it feeding on copper what species it what species of copper pods is it if you have two prey items that have similar isotope ratios it's almost impossible using the isotope ratio of the consumer alone to say which of these those two prey species it was feeding on yeah, so definitely we need to combine isotopes with other stuff. And that's, I think I, I had it in the text somewhere at least that the isotopes, the, the great benefit of this is that we can do this for at $15, $20 max almost per, per fish. So we can get a lot of course information really easily. If we can then combine that with stomach content, with actual telemetry, with tagging or tracking data, or some of the, the more advanced compound specific isotope work. It allows us then to better understand the patterns and the trends that we see in the, in the isotope data. Yeah, Because trying to interpret these data, I've given you my current sort of best assessment of the preliminary data that we had. There's a lot of other things that could be going on. And it's just because, again, we only have two markers for this at the moment. We only have carbon and nitrogen. And that's kind of two axes that we can explore variability. And that means that we're, we're combining a lot of different things that could be influencing these isotope ratios. So definitely stomach content or tracking or, or other things. That the strength of this is in combination with, with different techniques. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, so that seems to be the end of the questions right now. Um, if folks do have questions afterwards, feel free to send me um, an email and I can pass them along to Brian. We did re just receive one comment. Jeff Murphy uh, says, great presentation, Brian. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Um, I see so we've still got 60 something people here. So thanks for hanging around. Um, so Brian, thank you so much. It was an excellent presentation. And as usual, we'll be, we've recorded it and we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel uh, very shortly. So I would like to remind everyone that our next webinar will be on November 4th. Anton O'Sullivan of UMB and CRI will be speaking about the hydrological interconnectedness of landscapes, forests, and rivers. So a big thank you again to Brian for today's presentation and to everyone who participated. We hope you can all join us again very soon. Yeah, thanks, Darla. And just so before I go, if anybody out there has salmon scales that they want to analyze, do send me an email because I'm more than happy to, to run additional samples. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Darla. See you later.